Okay, that's starting. Good afternoon, everyone, from uh, sunny Windsor in, in southeast of England. Richard O'Sullivan here. Um, today we are going to cover the first day and the up to the fourth day of the Battle of Luce, which was started on the 25th of September 1915, and really concentrate on the role played by the 47th London Division, including the 1st Battalion of the London Irish Rifles. So just to give an outline of what we want to do today. So I try to get my mouse to work. This is where we are. Um, hopefully the talk will only last about 40 minutes and we'll have a chance to speak. I see we have a couple of um, relatives, uh, Andrew in, um, in England, whose great grandfather served at Luz. It's good to see you and some London Irish rifle men and Irish rangers from the prior period. Just a quick moment, I'll just explain what the painting in the right hand side, or not the painting, the, the, the artwork in the right hand corner, it's Lady Elizabeth Butler's presentation of, of the Battle of Lou. She, she drew that in 1916, a bit of artistic license as I've just said, because they would have been wearing gas masks. In 1914, at the outbreak of war in August, at the start of August, in, in the outbreak, uh, the, the British declared war in the evening of the 4th or the 3rd and 4th of um, August 1914. The London Irish Rifles, a, a pre-war territorial force battalion, were actually on annual camp down in uh, Salisbury Plain. And that picture is actually a, a picture of the officers of that period, but taken in October 19. 14 and I picked out the commanding officer at the time and I uh, Lieutenant Colonel from Cannon he, he was born in England but um, he, he's, he had a Galway address at some point during this period um, but that's the officer cadre I'm gonna let one more in sorry and in 1914 and the theme of football the London Irish football squad. And there's a familiar face to Andrew Warren, his great grandfather was sitting at the front, Reg Warren, and Ma Ma Major Beresford, who, who was a leading figure in the London Irish Rifles pre-war and actually took a strong role at Luce. So in August 14, uh, the 1st Battalion had a thousand men in total and they all were, got the message back and they came back to Chelsea. They'd right, come in the in Salisbury Plain only, only for a short period. Um, but they returned to Chelsea almost immediately and they were ready for war. But uh, being a territorial force, so you had to sign a specific agreement to those who, who to wish to go overseas. Uh, a second battalion was raised, you know, the call to arms of volunteers went out in August by Kitchener. So the second battalion was raised almost immediately and that eventually went out to Greece and uh, Palestine later in the year, uh, sorry, later in the war. Uh, the first battalion, though, spent the first... Um, eight months of the war training really in South St Albans. So they, they a lot of our home front. Kitchener as the Secretary of State of War was, was a bit suspicious of, um, of the territorial force. So he's called out to volunteers, his, his Kitchener divisions, and there were three, 300,000, 18 divisions were created. But the TF, territorial force, which was created in 1918, had a slight odor according to uh, Kitchener, it seems. So, Although some battalions of the, the London division went out straight away to the Western Front and they actually joined other divisions. So the, the London Scottish, who we revere today as the 14th Battalion London Regiment, actually joined the 1st Division almost straight away in September 1914, for example. But most of the other London regiments stayed training in Britain until early 1915. Just to explain that the, even we call it the London Irish Rifles, they, they, they were part of the London Regiment in those days. It was a battalion, sorry, a regiment formed in 1859. And they were the 18th Battalion of the London Regiment. And the one at the start, the 118th means they were the first line. They were the first part of the um, first group battalion. So they went out to France from Southampton on the 9th of March. As I say, the commanding officer at that time was Concannon who had received a DSO in the Boer War. 
coincidentally, we, we bought his medal set last week in, a, in an auction. So we had the DSO on display at our meeting on Friday. So as you see, in the, in the First World War of Italian, there was over a thousand men. In the second, it was around 750. So you know, it, it, there was a, a battalion size was quite big. As mentioned, the 47th Division, the London Division, it was actually at the time the second London Division, but to avoid complication of terminology, it changed to 47th Division in 1915. But I put in brackets the first line of the second division. And it was part of the 141st Infantry Brigade. So in a division, the 47th Division would have been uh, three brigades of three battalions in this or four battalions, sorry, in this division. Some, some divisions actually had five battalions, and that was a slight anomaly. But the other battalions in the brigade with the London Irish were two, so I can do the geography, one from South London and two from north of the river. Um, in fact, they were all, yeah, that's right, Black Eaves and stuff, sorry. So as I say, in March the 9th, uh, the the battalion was called, the battles had gone through in, in, through 1914 into the early part of 1915, and they sailed from Southampton, arrived near Le Havre port on the 10th. And that, that map just gives you a visualization of the distance. That's not actually the route they would have taken. They would have gone through Abbeville, but they, would, they had ended up in Castle, but you can, Castle, uh, 250 miles or just under 250 miles. Uh, the usual thing, eight horses, 40 men on the, on the outside of the, the car. So it took them 20, over almost a day to get from uh, Le Havre port to, to Castle. If I'm pronouncing that correctly, Andrew can correct me later. Just, uh, just a quick, and not, I was going to say, totally, quick, quick review of what the Western Front had, was looking like in early 15. After the first advances and retreats, the, the Western Front eventually, in, early, in late 1914, looked like this, from the Belgian coast and, and ultimately down to Switzerland. And um, it was now a trench warfare situation. And that's the line. The area we are talking about and where the London Irish went to when they first went to France is in this area, um, just south of the Belgian border. Um, in the loot, well, lose long, long city, Vimy, not lanes we know now from wartime, but uh, in northern France, just to the southwest of Lille, the big city of Lille. So that's how the Western Front looked at the start of 1915. So when the, uh, when the London Irish came out to France, the Lille is, is about 20 miles from Castle. But that was their movements during the spring and summer and early autumn was, um, I know, I know, <laughs> crazy stuff. But um, th that's how they moved through those first six months. But I'll pick out a couple of places. Uh, the f in March of that year, the first battle, real ad aggressive battle or uh, offensive battle of the, of the British was in Northern France in, near Neuve Chapelle and the Indian forces. And then in May, when just after the London Irish arrived in the area, their first battle, and the 47th Division's first battle on that, they fought near Festubert, and that actually is quite a well known in London Irish rifle circles. So they're the circle bits. And the, the purple is where eventually they arrived in, in late summer for the Battle of Luz. But that gives you an idea of all the movements. I think the, the commanders obviously knew what they were doing, but I, I presume they were moving in these different directions for good reason but just gives you an idea of the movements. Just a few moments on Festubert. The London Irish came to the line, but actually at Festubert, even though it's on their battle honours, they, they were principally in flank guard, as you can see from the description. Uh, that comedic caricature sketch, that's the first of many that will go through this, uh, drawn by Harry Tyre, CSM at the time, who was in the London Irish. But um, the first fight in well, the first battle on the 40 dev, 47th Division, the London Division, made a good name for itself at Festube at the third week with the Canadian forces were, were active in, um, in that battle period. I won't describe the battle in, in detail, but that really is the first fighting that the London Irish were involved with. Their first casualty had actually occurred at the end of March when they entered the line. I'm just going to pick out one character from the 24th Battalion. 
the 47th Division was awarded two Victoria Crosses during the First World War, and, and Lieutenant Lennon Keyworth was the one who was awarded at that time, the first one. The 24th Battalion London Regiment was part of the 142 Brigade. Their base is actually was in Kennington Lane, quite close to the now the current day London Rifles HQ. But he was awarded the DC for his act, for his um, conspicuous bravery at Vivanchi near Festubert, Festubert, end of May. Unfortunately, and this might be a theme of the conversation, he, he died in October 1915 of wounds. He's buried in Abbeville. So as many of these conversations about war focus on men whose bravery is shown even before, just about before they're awarded any award, they, they die in battle. So what was happening as the London Irish through the summer? The, there was now a need from the high command for some ag aggressive activity. The French forces to the south and to the east were very keen for, for the British army to get involved in an offensive battle. There's strong, as in all the battles I, I know of, the discussions between the coalition forces about where and how. Um, Kitchener, Secretary of State of War, Alexander Haig was the first army commander uh, in his picture on the right. Sorry, Alexander Haig is actually not him, is it's Douglas Haig. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about Alexander Haig later. Um, and also there was some issues to do with the Eastern Front. It was almost like a Second World War theme, isn't it? Uh, the Russians wanted some aggressive activity on the Western Front. But anyway, this map shows that the, the plan of attack was to go north in the Artois, Artois region. The red arrow showing the First Army uh, advance really towards Lille. Behind the front line in that area was a lot of rail hubs and uh, there was a view that cavalry forces could break out and move through to a lower ground and, and break open the front. So the first army under Haig had two corps in initially, six divisions, and then had a reverse, a reserve corps, as well as a cavalry corps ready. It was, the ground was actually described as most unfavorable. The decision, as you see later, the ground at Luz was certainly not necessarily the best for any uh, offensive activity, but what is, I guess. The plan as the fourth corps, so just to go back one, the first army under Haig had two corps, so the first corps and the fourth corps. Uh, we concentrate largely in this conversation about the fourth corps and the 47th division's role in it, as well as the 15th did. Going from north to south, so the geography there, uh, you have to probably remind yourself of the first picture, was um, is the south of the La Basse Canal down to Long in rough terms. But uh, the red, strong red arrow um, line there, that's the core boundary between the fourth and second corps. But I'll give you... Uh, just missed someone. We'll go back to that. The core commander was Lieutenant General Rawlinson. So the fourth corps below or to the south of that strong red line. As you can see, the divisional second, ninth, seventh in the first corps, that two of those were uh, regular army divisions, but of course, by this, the end of 1915, the regular, the regular army who had started in 1914, it was a question how many remained. The 9th Division in the 1st Corps was actually uh, a Scottish, it was one of the first Kitchener volunteers. More appropriately for this conversation, down on the southern side, the 4th Corps, the 1st Division is obviously the prime in number terms, numeric terms of the British regular division. But as I mentioned, it had some um, TF and volunteer battalions in, including London Scottish. And the 15th Division, there's a K2, a Kitchener 2nd uh, division of Scottish Scotsmen, and the 47th Division was the uh, London Division. So their, their role was in the south of the whole line. And the objectives of the 4th Corps is that blue circular thing on the right, or oval, is to break through the, the, the town of Luz. There's front line trenches, is this black line, that's a German. There's a subsidiary second line German trench in front of Luz, and the actual strong second line trenches for the Germans was to the east of Luz, or quite a ways to the east of Luz. So 
some of the geography and um, of Luz at the time, the Crossier is a slag heap. So the area of Luz is a mining area, or was up to 1986. Now, one of the descriptions was they come from England to, to visit the Black Country, which is a, a mining area in Staffordshire, or was in the in previous years. So the top picture shows a double crassier. And below Tower Bridge was one of the pit um, wheels. Uh, and the second one of that is the Tower Bridge. It was dubbed Tower Bridge. It wasn't called Tower Bridge, but it was dubbed because of its London, the London connection. C below, it was destroyed on the right-hand side at some point, I think later on. But this is a site of messages. A few officers I pick out up front. Tradinek had taken over from Con Cannon in about May of 15. And Beresford, we've seen in the football team, he, he was second in command, would take a leading role in this battle. And Trender, Mann and Hobbs were, each of them were company commanders of the advance of Lewis. They're all, those pictures were when they were variously lieutenants, but Captain Trender remained for this battle. And Dale on the left-hand corner was actually notable, supposedly for being the smallest man in the battalion. Although I've seen a picture, he doesn't look as small as, it, as they suggest. But I picked five out. Tradinek was uh, the colonel at st this stage. He was a Royal Dublin Fusilier. He was actually an Irishman, I believe. So most of the London Irish were London-born, but he was born in Dublin. And more, another pictorial of the battlefield. So looking from the, the front line there, looking towards Luz in a north easterly direction. And so you see some part of the flat, but the actual raised bit at the end is, is another slag heap in the town centre, Luz Cassia, see Tower Bridge on the left. The London Irish advance was slightly to the left of that Tower Bridge or going towards Tower Bridge from another direction, although their line of attack was actually towards the cemetery, just to the right of the cemetery, in fact. So the 47th Division, just zooming in on that somewhat. Um, so we've come down to the area in front of Luz, just to remind ourselves of the front line German trenches, the British first line, and this subsidiary line of defense in front of the town village of Luz. I don't know what to call it a town or a village, but... Um, and so the roles, the London Irish were leading out on, on, in terms of the 141st Brigade, they were going to be followed by to the left by the 19th London Regiment and the 20th would then come through, once the London Irish were in the second lose defence trench, the 20th would come through and uh, uh, consolidate and go through actually into the town and uh, start to develop uh, the attack. On the right hand side, the 140th Brigade had two battalions just near the slag heaps. One actually went on to it. So the 6th and 7th London Regiment, that's the 6th LR, and the 7th attacked in that direction. Um, the objective was to really, uh, going back to the battle, the whole battlefield, the 47th Division being on the right flank of the 6th Divisions, they were, their objective was really to hold a flank and direct their look towards Long City. Just the same map and um, the point just to make immediately is that gas was now in uh, part of the, the means of attack and they were gonna attack on a free pl Greek platoon front. So each company, A, C and D would be together and there'd be five waves, four waves from D, C and A. We'd probably have to go and get some um, practical look of what that would look like uh, and B to follow up as the fifth wave. So four waves. So D, C and A would be in the first wave, C, D and A in the second wave and A. Well, I'm explaining myself very badly there, but anyway, <laughs> the three battalion advance, three company attack towards the right of the cemetery. And the names you met, I've seen the pictures, Trinder, Mann and Hobbs and Willick would come up as a story there. Once they were in the Luz defence, the 19th and 20th, when they come through, um, and they expected the second line, the Luz defence line, to be more heavily entrenched. But as we understand it, and others may explain it a little better than me later, 
the doctrine was actually, you know, four days of artillery, softening up the German defenses, hopefully wires are cut, and then a quick trot initially, big pack backs, you couldn't run all that distance, but you get close to the defense line and then run again. One of the major offensive actions was bombers, grenade throwers coming in, going to the German line and throwing grenades in. Um, just some personal comments. Harry Tyres, who, who is a caricaturist or cartoonist, was there in a company, as he says. Um, the gas was turned on at 5.50, 40 minutes before the 6.30 attack time. And that was his visualization later of what he saw and heard. And uh, making a quite a amusing comment about an Irishman, whether he picked out that just for his narrative, an Irishman who lost his nerve and started to sing and then got bomb happy, I don't know what the phrasing is, and went to over with the others. But his caricatures or his cartoons litter this, the history of the London Irish. A more well known name, name, perhaps, Frank Edwards in A Company. And these three men in A Company were later described as the footballers of Lewes. The context of the footballers of Lewes, or football at Lewes, was obviously, well, not obviously, but in Christmas 1914, um, at the period of the truce, there was a, you know, what, what the real story of the truce is not always well explained, and I won't try and explain it here, but there was some feeling that there shouldn't be any fraternization or you, know, you shouldn't be making light of these experiences. But the London Irish football team, uh, Reg Warren, I don't know whether he brought his football with him, but seemingly quite a number of them brought their football with them and they blew them up ready to kick them over. And in actual fact, you know, under orders, Lieutenant Dale, that small officer we saw, actually punctured one, but the men came back and decided to re-blow them. So Frank Edwards, was a well-known character. He, he was a, a pre-war terrier. Kicked the football out. And the second man to kick the ball was Rifleman Mickey Millen. But he, um, both of them were wounded almost immediately. And actually Edwards was suffered from gas inhalation issues for the rest of his life. You know, as we said, the gas was used by the British, but uh, they didn't, it didn't go fully forward into the German trenches. In other areas of the front, he actually went backwards. So. I think the 47th Division did better than most out of it. And there's a description of what they look like. I mean, that picture probably is a bit more realistic than Lady Butler's, as apart from um, they wouldn't be all crowded around as, as, like, as that, I think. But they were shrouded with the gas masks and goggles. They, they probably, for the for German defenders, probably looked a bit um, gruesome and intimidating. So the footballers of use lose the, the story, which is a true story. Um, around these four men, Edwards, Millam, Taylor and Dalby, although others I'm sure kick a, kick the foot, kicked a football at other times. Battlefield was full of smoke, a gas, gas and smoke mixture and just a further description of what they were looking like, second or third wave, fourth wave. And then the fifth wave came through, which was D Company under Willock, and the HQ Company came further. So just a simple description of what was looking, looking like grenades being thrown, stopping and shooting. Second line trench was um, seemingly more heavily defended than the first. Or this is all comparative, by the way, because a lot of people were killed and wounded in, in this front. Another member of the first 18th at Lewes, Rifleman Patrick McGill, was actually a well-known poet and author even before the war. And in fact, he, in 1914 in August, he lived about half a mile from where I'm sitting here. He was a librarian at Windsor Castle, would you believe? But he was uh, born in Donegal in the west, northwest of Ireland. And he's wrote a fantastic book about uh, the battles, which I, in my opinion, it's a great book that 
I don't know what you can say, but that's a, that's a compendium of, of his of his stories. But he was present. He was a stretcher bearer, and and some nice descriptions, I think, about um, if you can talk about. I keep having to say this that this, this is a a bloody battle, and he witnessed it. Scenes the footballers are lose on the right of his uh, of his position. Obviously, he didn't go over the front over the top initially, but he. This was a witness. He wrote this book and narrative a month, very soon after the battle. So it was almost contemporary memory. Another member, Sidney Spee, 12 platoon. He was, for the London Irish Rifleman on the call, he was actually born or lived in Vassal Road, which is about, what's it, about half a mile from the current London Irish Rifles HQ in Camwell. And what he did, his, he had joined, he was born in Sittenbourne, but he, he joined the Colours. He had done volunteering in the, in the early 20th century, but joined up in August 14 again. And he's left a diary of what he was doing on this 25th of September. And I was picking out a bit of it there, just repeating the other visualizations of, of the other memory. So the, the attack, they were going towards the loose cemetery, a big crucifix they were looking towards and remembering the gas and smoke. And a little bit more viscerally, he goes viscerally in a visceral description. You know, you can see some of the words he had written. This is, he wrote this at the time. So it, 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 this is the reality of the situation, I think. The readout, no time to be lost now. The whole mass of troops move forward, bullets flying and shells bursting everywhere. The fellows falling all around. It was an awful sight, but it seemed to put new life into me. The only thought I had was to get near enough to plug them in the same way. Owing to the thick cloud of smoke, we slowly lost our direction, going rather too far to our left. But the mistake was quickly rectified and we reached their first line where we came face to face with the 22nd Bavarians. So, yeah, sorry, I was probably reading it out with too much um, positivity there. But that's Sydney Speed's description. The 47th advance was pretty successful uh, on the morning of the 25th. Uh, the second, uh, first battalion of London Irish have reached its objectives near the Lou Cemetery second line trench. The 20th came up and the 19th on the left consolidated. The 20th went through and by nine o'clock, the village of Luz was totally in the 47th division's hands. The 6th and 7th on the right consolidating another line of, of defense there on the, on the second line, part of an adjunct to the second line defense near the Cassia. In fact, after three hours, the attack started at 6.30. Everything was um, in this sector, this division was going well. They could see the Scots, the 15th Division, on their left-hand side, and their advance was just the Lons Road without going around this way, but you'll see a bit more of that in a minute. Just they would advance to Hill 70, one of the high points to the east of Luz. But the other divisions, the 1st Division to the left of 15th Division wasn't advancing so far, and then the 1st Corps generally was facing significant issues, both through the gas return into their own lines, and other redoubts and strong points of the Germans. One famous one, Hohenzollern redoubt in the northern part of this battle sector. But I won't talk about that too much. I will speak a bit more about 15th in a minute, 15th Division. So just a, a, a review of the outcome of day one and the battlefield. The first corps, as I've mentioned, hadn't really progressed too much in the north, but down in the southern part, the 47th and the 15th. In a general sense, we're going, doing well initially. The 15th Division advanced into the east of Blues Village, the Hill 70, were under counterattack quite soon in the afternoon. Uh, the 47th Division started to create a defensive line looking southeast towards Long, while the 15th Division went through. The fog of war was in, but surprisingly, not many of the 47th Division battalions or lost its way. I think only they mentioned only two platoons of A Company of the London Irish lost its way. But the 15th Div Division, the Scottish forces, were now facing significant 
problems on Hill 70 of counterattack. The expectation of the front that there would be some reinforcements coming through from the rear um, and uh, the 21st and 24th Division in particular were meant to be coming forward. I'll mention them in the morning. But in the North, the First Corps, the Second Division in particular, right at the North, had no advance whatsoever. The Ninth got to the Hohenzollern Redoubt, and the Seventh, those three middle divisions had limited progress. And on the right hand side, south along, the French attack in this sector wasn't particularly successful. Now there's a big issue emerged that. There was a delay in bringing up reserve. The 11th Corps in reserve, the reserve corps, uh, was was not advancing as quickly. These 21st and 24th get a lot of stigma because, well, they do. <laughs> but um, they, they, the, the numbering scheme of the Kitchener third line, so they were the third group of divisions, or three, two of the third Kitchener divisions. And then in that core, the, the guards division were going to be brought up as well. So we'll mention the guards in a minute. The first day of the battle, give you an idea, a division is about 15,000, I think, in those days. So 10%. The 47th division, you could argue, got off better than most, where you'll see in a minute. Once I get that, though. The 15th division on the left three times as much or more than three times. So their casualties were into the 35, 40% levels and the two brigades of the 15th Division suffering immensely. So the five attacking battalions of the London, uh, of the London Division, you could say relatively low amount of casualties, but every man was important, of course. The first day of the, uh, of the Battle of Luz, in fact, the Luz battle but the London Irish was the second highest death toll in their history. The highest was actually a year, year later in High Wood. These are the 69 men. You can see a lot of London addresses here, but a few Scots addresses and a few Irish. There's this 38 year old CSM Robert Cunningham from Sligo. He has a very early number, in less than 100, I believe, or well, about 150, so suggests he was a, a long term terrier. He was CSM Robert Cunningham in Sligo town, just outside Sligo town. I looked up because I have I got a propensity to follow a football team from the north of London. I looked at the two men from Tottenham. I could see the dresses. I walked past one of their front doors near, near Northumberland Park when I go to see Tottenham Hotspur. You can see mostly London addresses. It doesn't necessarily mean they were London born, of course, but um, a significant amount of them were London born. And just, I won't pick names out of this, but as well as we saw the 69 and the casualty total was about 250, so there were significant amounts of wounding and gas. But the proportion of wounds to death, so I suppose, were much higher. No, what do I mean? Um, the, the, in the Second World War, I think if you have wounds, you multiply by 10. But uh, in this case, there were four times as many wounds as deaths. And of course, many were gassed. Not only those on that list, in but uh, others we mentioned, Frank Edwards amongst others. So they actually published the names in the newspapers, which is not surprising. Picking a few others, Harry Turner. He was actually a West, uh, librarian with Westminster City Council from the city. His brother was in the 25th Battalion, Cyclists Battalion. Henry Cave from South London. He actually joined, he's a young man, 20 years of age. He actually joined in 1915. He went to the Duke of York's in Sloan Square, joined in 1915, eight, April, and then only came to France in August, about a month before he was killed. William Davy was a London County Council store in the Stores Department, lived in East London. Harry Tremlett enlisted in was 14, but was, seemed to be ill and um, didn't go out with Italian in March 15, but then came out in August. He worked in the post office in East London. These are only four. And a couple of officers. Lionel Pratt, um, he, was, he, he lived, his father owned Ryston Hall of Down and Market. And so he came from, the officers in general terms, perhaps come from a wealthy background, but uh, like Lionel Pratt, his father was a landowner in Norfolk. Arthur Jacob, 
um, a young man from Dublin, from the southern part of Dublin. He, he came to some prominence a few years ago because there was some comment at some point that he, 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 he there was some discussion about the, the final resting place of Radio Kipling's son and uh, um, Arthur Jacob was one of the men that was put forward as possibly as an alternative. So we're dealing with a lot of deaf here, I'm sorry. This gentleman here was the OC of uh, the company commander of D Company, the follow-up battalion on the first morning, and he actually um, was killed. And uh, that's Colonel Ant Meyer, our Northern Ireland boss. But uh, what's interesting about that is the epitaph on, on the, um, that's in Lou's, that corner Lou's, a very long epitaph. And the last bit, the last bit of inverted commas, which is peace, peace, he's not dead, he doth not sleep, he have wakened from the dream of life. I think it's a quote from Shelley, I believe. But I think there's always a discussion about that being a long epitaph. So day two of the battle, so we in rough terms covered day one. This is another map, but the reason to put this up is on the 26th. So the red lines there in rough terms where the London division were, were flank guard of the whole division and the corps ultimately with any counterattacks coming there have been attacks of the 15th division at hill 70 rebuffed and now the, the 24th and the 21st divisions were brought up the 21st joined with the 15th division to again attack hill 70 on the morning of the 26th of september but this was significantly rebuffed and now there was retirements now and this it's not an exact map really, but this blue dotted line suggesting, and it's really reinforcing what have happened on the 26th is the flank of the 47th division used to be started to become exposed. The first division to the north had, was retreating the 40, and, and there was a significant issue for the 47th division. So there was great fear that would be outflanking, but the uh, London Irish seemed to believe they could hold this with the other battalions of the London division, hold the line. Tradinek, Tradinek the colonel, walking around saying we won't move back. And, and this became, you could argue, more importantly than the kicking of the football, well, much more important than the kicking of the football was a, the contribution to the Battle of the London Irish, not only getting into the second line trenches, but holding the line and defensively on the 26th. On the 27th, the guards were brought up and attacked again Hill 70 to the east of Luz in the afternoon. Just a reminder that the three battalions, the Guards Division was only just recently created, but um, the, the third battalion was a Grenadier newly formed, but the first Coldstream, second Irish Guards and the first Scots Guards came up and the London Irish viewed this and, and were quite impressed. There's another comment I'll show later about what they thought of the Guards come out. This is on the 27th of uh, the 26th, the London Irish held their position. The 27th, they, they still remained the same. They did join in an attack on the Hill Cops. Two characters in the Irish Guards, Second Battalion, Captain Alexander, who was a company commander, and I just mentioned him previously, the son of Rudyard Kipling, who was killed on the 27th. His body was not found for many years, but has now been identified in his burial, is now stated in in St. Mary's ATS, just an awful lose. Captain Alexander looks familiar, doesn't he? He later became Field Marshal Alexander, and uh, he was the president of the London Irish Rifles Association and honorary colonel of the London Irish after the Second World War. He was my father's commanding officer in Italy. Well, ultimate commanding officer, commander in chief, actually, um, in 1944, 45. Famous character. Another description of the guards coming forward came from what was Rifleman, his nickname was Squire Monday, but he's, he's, he's later pictured there as a sergeant. Um, he was out getting a tea urn and seemed to be his friend, his mate, and it's, he then saw the guards coming forward in perfect form. And um, he was stopped by a, a young subaltern from the Irish Guards who said, who the devil are you? He doesn't actually say Irish Guards, but I'd call him an Irish Guards. And seeing these two men lugging a tear and across the battlefield. Um, 
and goes on to have this um, encounter with a guardsman. Perhaps it's a mythical story adding to the London Irish story. It's quite amusing, I thought. Squire Mundy later in his life became a, a British ambassador in El Salvador, I believe. And he, he became a notable character many years later. The London Irish were in the line and the 47th Division for four days. Um, and through the 27th, the guards attacked. There was no particular progress. And uh, eventually on the 28th, they were relieved on the line. It was raining, muddy. The battlefield was obscure. Clearly the big push or the advance hadn't succeeded. And they were quite pleased to be taken out of the line. That picture isn't of the London Irish, I don't think, but um, that's a contemporary picture. And they moved back to, to the billets in the evening of 10.30 and started to clear up. And um, I think we said it was about 200, wasn't there, casualty early. It's the description in the World Diary say 300 killed, wounded and missing. Um, and A Company alone had uh, 90 casualties. That was Frank Edwards' um, company. So by the 30th, the London Irish were out of the line. Other battalions of the London Regiment had come into the line by then, the 22nd, as you can see above. The battle made the news back in England. In fact, the London Irish made the news back in London. Um, and dispatch, I think Gibbs wrote this, didn't he? The journalist Gibbs in the weekly dispatch at the end of October. It's a battle now, you might argue, is sort of not as well known as many others lose. But at the time, it was a major story. A couple of the battle, uh, the cannons of the German forces were paraded. There was a little bit of controversy seemingly because um, this is 1915 and the Irish question had obviously been there for many years before the First World War. Um, and, and there was a, some negative feeling that the, the London Irish should have featured in this display at Horse Guards Parade. Sorry to be so parochial about the London Irish, but uh, this is what the contemporary stories suggest. And it led to some recruitment initiatives, reading the caption at the bottom, the recruiting sergeant saying name and nationality, and the gentleman who looks a bit like Patrick McGill actually saying, I'm a Welsh French polisher, work at Swiss Cottage, drink scotch, and I want to join the London Irish. Don't know whether anyone laughed at that or not, but I, I didn't, but anyway, I thought I'd put it up. Yeah, the casualties, the battle went on for another three weeks until the middle of October. The total British cattle casualties totaled 62, and that 62,000, then that included subsidiary uh, attacks in the area. But um, out of the 61, the Fourth Corps represented about, um, about a quarter, just under a quarter uh, of the total casualties. The First Corps and the Fourth, the, the Eleventh Corps had come through and, and you see significant casualties even for the Reserve Division, sorry, Reserve Corps. Deaths for the Corps, 2031, and the 47th Division. Just the scale of it is hard to comprehend, really. But compared, I suppose, to the later battles, this was rather minor, you could say. Not that any, anything here is nice to look at. The controversy of the 21st and 24th Division not coming up was flare, flared up over a period, and there was political intent misstatements in dispatches, it seems, and not Alexander Haig, but Douglas Haig eventually took over as uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Army. So John French was replaced by at the end of the year. So the famous figure of Douglas Haig now came fully into the picture as Commander-in-Chief after a few months after the Battle of Luz. So this impact on the, the governance or the army governance or the military leadership of the army in the Western Front changed quite significantly after that, in terms of character, that is. Just to cover off the end of the presentation in rough terms, what happened to some of the men who were at Lewes? Frank Edwards, the footballer, he lived to, to the ripe age of uh, 72. And actually is a, is a pub or was a pub in Whitton near Twickenham Rugby Football Club with his picture on and uh, the rifleman. Frank Edwards, 
continued in the Territorial Army after the war, but affected by gas and, and wounds he suffered at Lewes. He got a blighty one, which was a useful thing to get back to the home front. Poet and author Patrick McGill, and he's visualized by Harry Tyers in the, in the, in the cartoon. And it was probably accurate because his book came out very soon after. He got married, would you believe? He got wounded at Lewes, got married about two months later. Reception at the Wardorf. And his um, commemoration is in Glentis in County Donegal in, in the west, northwest of Ireland. We went there about six months ago. Does a bit of quick, quick arithmetic nine months ago in January. So it's actually a memorial spot for Patrick McGill in, in the Republic of Ireland. He was the librarian in Windsor Castle before the war. But he moved to America later in life. His, his story, in a sense, got lost for a while, you could say, but his books are fantastic to read, I think. Harry Tyler's the cartoonist. Again, I lived to a ripe old age. He became RSM later. Uh, I met his son about five years ago or so, when he came from London Irish. His son isn't that, but uh, Harry is a great book of cartoons, which I borrowed from the museum, if you can see this. Oh, no, you can't see it. It's not even worth showing. But, um, excuse me, just lost my earpiece. But Harry got through. Sidney Speed, the chap from Vassal Road, who, who described the very strong feeling at the time of attack, sadly, is the word I could use in this context, died near Luz, but not during the Battle of Luz. And he's buried a philosophy, philosophy, well, again, the pronunciation, I should know. He was, he died about three weeks later in the end of October. What was the story about Sidney Speed that comes to mind is that he, he wrote two letters home to his mother after the Battle of Luz, but before he died, of course, but um, they were both destroyed because they were put into the wrong colour envelope, would you believe? And there was quite a bit of controversy that the two letters he had sent home were destroyed before his mother being able to read them. And the questions went to Parliament about this. That's a cut in from the Daily Express in November of that year. Another man we hadn't mentioned was Arthur Cunningham. He got a DCM at, uh, at Luz. And um, a year later, he was killed at High Wood on the first day at High Wood. He was, he was 25. He had two other brothers in the British Army, and both those brothers were killed also. He was born in Clonmel in the, in, in the Irish, in Ireland, sorry, in 1891. Um, his fourth brother, who didn't serve, became actually chairman of Shamrock Rovers Football Club in the 1950s. But again, a person who don't really speak about too much, I suppose, in circles, but another name to the remembered Arthur Cunningham. His home address on the Commonwealth Orgrave shows says that he was living in London. So actually, you wouldn't necessarily know he was an Irishman necessarily until family members got in touch. Paul Jackson, his great grand, great nephew, was planning to join us today, but he's not able to, sadly. Reg Warren, the footballer the football of London, I suppose we can call him, and Andrew, his great grandson here. And I've um, taken the liberty, sorry, Andrew, I've stolen one of your Twitter photographs of your daughter. So Reg's great, great granddaughter is in the scene of a great, great grandfather's death. And that's the epitaph on his headstone. He actually, and Andrew will probably mention a few more, well, many more things about him at the end of the talk. Um, he was a pre-war, Terry, as far as I know, and um, had gone through the 1914 up to July 1918 period. Rather tragic amongst many tragedies. The lose football, which I touched on, well, with gloves, I touched on Friday. It returned actually to the London Irish in 1923. It's now re, uh, reconditioned, but, um, and two characters we'd seen previously or had heard previously, Concana, Lieutenant Colonel Concannon, um, was the 1914 CEO into 1915. And Barrister took the leading role of the advance at Lewes, were, were present when it came back to the mess at the Duke of York's in 1923, I think. And um, that's what it looked like a few years ago, but now we've reconditioned it to look like that. Um, and Michael Shearer wore 
photographer whose father actually served my father in the Second World War took this photograph from the battlefield of Luz a few years ago and he he presents that in some exhibitions around the world and you can see the pancake flatness of the area that's the really the area London Irish advanced over the twin the current day nicely manicured twin uh, double quassia slag heaps of Luz. Yeah, the veterans went back a number of times on the 50th anniversary. And these aren't the veterans, but 100 years since we, we visited again. Um, I met Andrew there, actually. A couple of current day photographs to, to represent the flatness of the geography of the battlefield. This photograph on the top left is from really from the uh, Dud Corner Cemetery looking southwest towards the, the double cross here and a picture from Dud Corner Cemetery and the description most unfavorable ground I believe was Haig's description in 1915 before the battle started. 69p men were killed on that single day but only actually two are buried at Dud Corner Cemetery most are in um, memorial on that memorial plaque at Dud Cemetery, Dud Corner Cemetery but we did visit, there are five London Irish buried at the uh, cemetery, including Willock, Captain Willock, who we saw earlier. So we uh, made our proper respects in 2015, these pictures. And the company men and the association paraded through the town of Luce. Now Luce on Kun Hat Gohau. And uh, there's a, a memorial in the town centre. Three of the men were killed on the 25th, but they're actually buried in another cemetery. And we, we placed the crosses there. What happened after this period? So they were relieved on the 28th on the fourth day. And then they moved, the 47th to moved a few miles north, not very far, in the loose sector still. The French took over that specific village area. And um, the London Irish and the 47th Division moved slightly to the north. And actually, it's sometimes arbitrary when a battle might be seen to have ended, the battle formally ended on the 16th of October. Although, as you see, the Sydney Speed was killed or died of wounds soon after that date. The London Irish stayed in the line for two months on, one month off, until the new year and into the new year. Important things happened, like the Lord Mayor visited them, but um, into the new year, they were still in the loose sector, eventually move into Vimy Ridge South, not to take part in battle, but to take over another position a few miles to the south near Vimy Ridge. So for the period after the battle period we spoke about here, another 52 London Irish men were killed, including Sydney Speed during that um, near six months period up to 19... 16. And we remember, of course we do, and we visited. This is the memorial actually in the town centre, uh, the, the French memorial in the town centre of Luzon, Gohal. Gohal. Um, we visited 2015. In the town hall, there's a plaque commemorating the London Irish's role in the town hall. And, and we should have been visiting this week, in fact, I think that was the plan. Um, for the 105th anniversary, but uh, some other things have got in the way of being able to do so. And completing, and I've overrun, but uh, not too bad, um, the poem of Patrick McGill that was read by uh, one of our members at the cemetery in 2015. I'll try and read it now. Now, when we take the cobbled road, we often took before. Our thoughts are with the hearty lads who tread that way no more. Oh boys upon the level fields, if you could call to mind the wine of Café Pierre de Le Blanc, you wouldn't stay behind. But when we leave the trench at night and stagger neath our load, grey silent ghosts as light as air come with us down the road. And when we sit us down to drink, you sit beside us too, and drink at Cafe Pierre Leblanc, as once you used to do. That was written soon after by Patrick McGill. 
Thank you. What I'm going to do, I'm going to just take the recording off so I can end my filming and then we can have a chat if we want to.